if you like what we do here at Off the Deep End and wish to support us, the best thing you can do is to share it on your social media. But also, you can tell your mother, sister, cousin, auntie, the kids walking by you down the street, um, your gym crush, anybody about the episode you're listening to and why you liked it. There's also another way to support us, and it's to go to the link posted in the description and on our Facebook page. And when you become a subscriber, you'll have access to subscriber-only content and ad-free listening for every single episode we put out. No matter what you choose to do, I do greatly appreciate you for tapping in, and please do reach out to our Facebook page so we can chat. Tell us what you feel, what you think, um, what you don't like, what I could improve upon. Um, At the end of the day, this is meant to be a conversation starter. And just to be completely open and honest, every single penny that goes to the Author Deepin program with subscribers is going to help other people by spreading the word via ads or getting new microphones so we can have more people at a time. And I really do appreciate every single listener. So thank you so much. I hope you have a great day and don't pass the pain. All right. Excellent. Well, I'm joined today by Miss Elizabeth Crawford, all the way from the beautiful state of Virginia. I was there for three years. Uh, Thank you so much for taking time after work to join us today. Of course. It's an honor to be able to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm super excited. So why don't we start with the very beginning? Tell me about a little bit about you growing up or a lot about you growing up. Depends on how you feel. (laughs) So uh, I was born into a Navy family. Um, my parents divorced when I was younger. Um, there was usually four of us. There's four, I have three biological siblings and depending on like who my dad was married to, depend on how many step siblings I had. Okay. So sometimes the house got really crowded. Sometimes it wasn't that bad. Um, for my, I was born in the Philippines when my parents were stationed there. And I am the third child and the middle daughter. So um, I think my older sister said I suffer from middle child syndrome uh, growing up. And um, so let's see, what else? Uh, I won't lie, I was a pretty depressed child. Um, I'm not sure if it was just the environment or, you know, having so many different things happening throughout my childhood, depending on like who was there and who wasn't there. Um, I honestly can say at my age now, I don't have a relationship with pretty much 95% of my family. Mm. I think I only speak to my father through text message on occasion. And Mm. that's pretty much about it. Is that a part of uh, your healthy boundaries that you've set for yourself? Yes. Um, I definitely, by the age of 25, I realized that I was doing all the work and had no one reciprocating. So I -hmm. just decided that what was best for me was to cut it all off at one time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what, uh, everyone should respect that. I definitely respect it. Setting healthy boundaries is never a bad thing. So, um, so can I ask you a couple questions about your childhood? So you're, you're in the Philippines what how how beautiful is it there because i've heard rumors how beautiful are the philippines well i actually was only there for a month after i was born okay so i did have a chance to visit the philippines when i was stationed in japan okay and it was actually very beautiful um i only spent a few days there but it was definitely an experience and it only took like 20 something years before i went back to the philippines after i was born (laughs) <laughs> I spent most of my childhood and adult and teenage years in Oklahoma, which is where mm-hmm. my dad was stationed and that's where he retired. Okay. So was, was he and your mother both in the military or just him? Uh, they both were. My mother was in for 10 years before she was medically separated for her back, but my father did the full 20. Well, I am, uh, I, I'm truly grateful for their service. Um, there's nothing greater than, um, understanding as a, as a military child myself growing up, the, the thing that it takes to keep the family running while another parent's deployed or while both parents, sometimes, um, unfortunately, both parents, they have different ser- service obligations um, where the timeline may never meet up and it can cause so much dysfunction in the household and stuff like that. So um, I'm appreciative of your parents for that and for obviously making you. So um, why don't you tell me a little bit about um, what, drove you to obviously serve the military as well? 
So I always wanted to join the military, but my father said no to it. He actually said that I needed to go to college and then join as an officer first. Mm. Um, if I was going to enlist, I, I needed to become an officer. Well, due to, I want to say differences of opinion, um, I got kicked out at 18 and I ended up moving to Utah for four years where I was, I was stuck. I had no future, no anything. And I finally decided, you know what, I've always wanted to serve. So that's, that was my next step. So I went to the recruiting office three or four times and the only ones there were the Navy. Three or four times. You are very persistent. Yes. And um, I told them, I said, I wanted to be, I wanted the process to go as quickly as possible because I knew I would back out if I had to wait like a year or two before I could actually join. And uh, at first they had me as an in, undesignated oh. heir, undesignated heir. Okay. And okay. My, <laughs> when my father found out, he called my recruiter and was like, you will get her rate. So they had me as IT next. And okay. that fell through because I didn't have my social security card in time because I had had my wallet stolen. And then uh, I ended up as a machinist mate, which is what I went in as. So so what is a machinist mate for those who are listening who don't understand? So a machinist mate is basically the mechanics of the ship. And we do all kinds of different things like catapults, elevators. Um, I personally was in reactor where I was a conventional mechanic who worked alongside the nuclear trained ones in the main machinery room, basically. So I worked on the big engines. Mm. And when I say big, they're like two stories tall. Oh yes, so, oh yes. I've, I've, I, um, I, I can't get in trouble for this. I, I've seen, I've seen the reactor rooms. I've seen, I've seen them all. Um, when I was moving, uh, doing helping my friends lift uh, he super heavy stuff like AC units and stuff like that. All the way down to the reactor spaces um, mm -hmm. with with my rigging team. Uh, we called our call ourselves Rig Team Six. Um, <laughs> back at deck department, we always got asked to help with that because rigging is kind of our, our thing. So we used to lower everything down into these reactor spaces, and I didn't ever have the qualifications or the uh, the TLDs on that you you would wear if you were allowed to go in these spaces. And I'd go in there and I'd walk in like I own the room, and they'd be, "What are you doing down here?" And I'm like, "Oh." wrong spot so i uh, i really enjoyed um being able to see what i never got to see um i was never i was never qualified to do anything nuclear related however learning about um everything from the different uh emergency uh for, for emergency steering all the way down to emergency diesel generators everything is super interesting to me to um the wildcats the captains uh the things that made the rest of the shift work so that i didn't get to see were super interesting so being the MM is, I was, I was always jealous of what the MMs got to do. Well, I mean, like I was really good at my job, um, at least in my opinion, because I worked really hard at it to the point where, you know, some of the officers confused me for a new, because I was so well-versed in like certain areas of the job. Um, I'm sure there were people who disagree with me, but that's all right. That's okay. Um, so I, I absolutely loved it. Um, it does burn you out because, you know, first on, last off every time. So it, it, it took a toll after a little while, but I mean, I enjoyed it. Absolutely. I think that different, different, there's a different career field for everybody in the military. Um, I'm not, I would be a, a very, very bold faced liar if I said I was super awesome and comfortable with the job I did. Um, was I good at it? I would say yes, uh, because of the feedback I got and because of the work I put into it. I would, yeah. I would, I used to set alarms to wake up every uh, four hours and study throughout the night. So at 2 a.m. I'd be waking up and I'd be studying for an hour and a half before I went back to sleep, before I got up for, for work the next day. So I'd walk mm -hmm. in every single day with an hour and a half worth of uh, less of sleep and more of, of studying. So I, I would have a, a competitive edge and it helped me advance. Ultimately, did you advance uh, relatively quickly? Because I, I know that 
the Navy has crazy advancement rates and quotas and stuff like that. Was that a factor? Actually, um, funnily enough, when I advanced to um, third class, it was on 100% advancement. Mm. We had two cycles that year where they were 100% advancement. So. Oh, well. Well, uh, you can still say you made it. That's all that matters. Yep. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So, so you're in the military now. You're doing uh, a lot of stuff that most people wouldn't even imagine to see. A lot of people see pictures of an aircraft carrier and they just see, oh, planes, cool, they land, Top Gun, Tom Cruise. Yeah, cool stuff, right? What are some of the takeaways that you would say that you received when you're – doing your normal day-to-day day, day operations. I know some people who worked uh, uh, in the MM field and in the, also in the reactor, right near the reactor guys, who never ever got to see sunlight for days because watches were ridiculous, sleep schedules, and you could either go out and enjoy the sunrise or you could enjoy the 160 degree heat outside or you can sit inside your nice cool room and sleep. Um, for the first couple of years, it was very back and forth when it came to like getting the qualifications, um, not getting on delinquent hours, the amount of information you had to absorb because a lot of a lot of the issues come with like most mechanics are very hands-on learners, whereas in the nuclear side, they're very they can quote through the book, like from the book. And you know, that was a big difference between the two of us is that we had to find common ground to, to learn. We'd have to have them show us what they knew as opposed to just reading it to them. So there was always that kind of discrepancy right there that kind of led to a lot of issues that I noticed. But like my final deployment, I was like senior in rate. Um, I, I had like, I was gauge CalPO and I had like some 500 gauges I had to account for at all times. Um, so it, it was quite a busy um, time for me. I spent every meal teaching somebody else. So I didn't have a lot of downtime, but I would see the sun every third day. Okay. Did you so, make it a did you make it a point to do that just for just No, uh, that just happened to be when um my rotation off the schedule. So I would be the up there for morning muster, which we had in the hangar bay. I don't know why, but we did. So I'd stand there and I my eyes would just burn mm. from uh, just being in the sun because I hadn't seen it in so many days. Oh my goodness. So, yeah. And I, like still do picnics were the worst. Oh yes. Oh, yes. Um, I remember the steel deck picnic. They had to set up a, uh, I don't know whose idea it was. It was someone's idea. So I was like, oh, let's set up a canopy. It was this giant canopy. There were no instructions. We had to just figure it the hell out. Uh, and we're setting it up. It's a, it's July 4th. Hundred. It was 159 degrees that day. The next day was the hottest day, I think, of that de entire deployment. So like July, July 5th was probably the hottest day. It was 160 but with the heat index and everything, it was 150 something degrees. I'm on the, on those top of the flight deck in these great all black uh, fire resistant uh, coveralls, and I'm so I'm wearing this and I'm sweating. I'm sweating my life away trying to set up this thing just for us to take it down three hours later. The steel beach picnics, they weren't all. It's not just leave it out of the Gulf. Just stay inside. Stay home. It's like COVID time. Stay home and stay safe. It's not worth it. It's not worth right. the sweat equity. <laughs> Right. And, you know, like working in my spaces, they were 120 degrees in the ventilation. And that's horrible. And it was even worse outside of that. But like to get around like heat stress monitoring, they'd have the thermometers in the air vents. My buddy just told me about that. Oh, my goodness. Mm -mm. And if you leave for more than 15 minutes, it's considered long enough and your time resets. Yeah. Mm -mm. I, uh, um, heat, heat, uh, I, I've had sailor, sailors drop, drop and collapse. Um, multiple people I got deployed with got heat stroke, um, heat exhaustion. They were showing every single sign of it possible. And, uh, 
I don't think it was just it was something that the the Navy really planned for when they went to the the uh, the Middle East because we're we have this thing called heat and then water and then you know steam and and it, how the how the you know humidity works when heat mixes with water it, it does weird things and then you add a, a metal ship full of human beings uh, things don't exactly line up good and then you make all those parts inside the ship move too things can get kind of weird they definitely can mm-hmm. oh my goodness. Well, okay. So where were you deployed to when you went on your deployment? So I was stationed in Japan mm-hmm. in Yokosuka. Mm-hmm. And I pretty much went to uh, I mean most of the Asia countries. Um like I think my favorite was Singapore. Um, but I went to Hong Kong like four times. I went to South Korea like four times. Um, I went to the Philippines, obviously. Went to Guam a couple times. Um, I didn't get to go to Thailand. I was very upset about that one. Uh, you know, Malaysia. so were we on the TR? Uh, on the TR, we were pretty <laughs> pissed about not going to Thailand. I, everyone talks about Thailand. I never got to go. Or Australia. We got a. I went to Australia. Oh. I want to. I want to go fight a kangaroo and get beat up. And tell tell a story about it, but is what it is. <laughs> so so what was so great about being so obviously you're in the seventh fleet over there in Yakuska. What was so great about being over there? Um, a lot of I know there's a lot of negatives um, in in some sailors' opinions and some marines' opinion. What did you enjoy about it? Oh, I absolutely loved Japan. Uh, I had no issues with it. Uh, the food was amazing. The culture is amazing. Um, for the most part, like you don't really get into too much trouble if you just are respectful over there. And like I know, like I've had friends that had issues with like um, the Japanese people, but I never had any issues. Um, it was just you know, it's always hit or miss with people and their situations. So, but uh, I definitely say the food was probably the best. Part of yeah, I love um, I love different cultures. Food. Uh, I try to spend um, as much time when I enter a different cultural setting, as much time as possible, learning from them about their um, how they think, how they feel, their discipline, um, things that they appreciate, things that they don't. Uh, what what is acceptable? What's what's permissible in this environment right here, and what's not? Um, and it's it's so beautiful to see someone else. And how their family structure works versus, as Americans, our family structure. Um, I, I I've always been so shocked when I hear that people get weirded out when they hear that we kick our children out sometimes when they're eighteen, or we tell them to leave leave their leave their little bird's nest just because they reach a certain age, or because they because they do something. Most families uh, outside of the U.S. outside of our culture don't do that. They don't believe in that. Their family, no matter what, and they stick together and they figure it out. Um, and that's something I've always admired about other cultures. What is your favorite food that you experienced over there in Japan? Um, hold on, I just blanked on it. Uh, Coco's. So what is that? Can you describe it for me so I can it's... write it down and go find it? <laughs> you can you can actually surprisingly find them in California. Okay. I think the San Diego area or the Los Angeles area, one of the two. But it's like breaded, deep fried chicken almost. It's not quite deep fried, but, um, and it's over rice with like a curry sauce. Ooh. And you could get like cheese naan or just, you know, I would eat there as often as possible next to like ramen because mm-hmm. you can't find ramen like that here. And the ramen was just amazing. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'll, I'll make sure to take note of that and I'll be, uh, I got an HMR down the street and my buddy works there. So I'll be asking him and having him help me find out what I need to find out. Uh, I always try to appreciate other cultures and, and learn. There's so much to learn from the world. If you just humble yourself and open yourself to the possibility of the universe, you'll find so much. So I understand that you went on deployments in the seventh fleet and the seventh fleet is usually, um, they're at a high tempo of deployment. So it's a couple months out, couple months, couple months in, correct? Actually, it's a six in, six out. Six in, six out. Okay. So six in, six out. Um, at least I, for the I, carrier. At least for the carrier. Okay. 
All right. So, because I know that everybody's everybody is different, so I don't I don't want to put a blanket statement down there. Um, so right. six in and six out is the rotation over there. Mm-hmm. Do you think that had a positive or negative effect on the sailors who were over there? Because I would I would ne- I would not necessarily say that's not being forward deployed. Um, you're you're deployed. You're in a in a strategically placed uh, naval base. Obviously, Seventh Fleet is there for a reason. So you're doing six months in, six months off. Were you doing mostly projection of power work against um, China and stuff like that, or were you doing uh, uh, building nation building work with uh, like I know we did unwrap when we got over there near Singapore. We did a lot of unwrap with the Indians, uh, the Indian Navy. Um. So as for like, we spent most of our time like we, you know, go through the usual going out um, in the six months time that we were in, it was, um, you know, fixing things on the ship, doing as much maintenance as possible. And then when we were out, it was more, I want to say for a show of power, Mm -hmm. um, just to kind of like deter um, China and like Russia from like doing stuff that they're not supposed to. Absolutely. Um, but we had done a few humanitarian things. Mm. Um, not many. I think I got one humanitarian, actual humanitarian thing while I was at to see, even though we pulled out like two or three times to help other countries and they're like, we didn't want your help. Okay. But we were there just in case kind of well, thing. Yeah, you know what? And, and nobody needs to take the help. Um, But when you show up and the help is provided, that's still a great thing as human beings. Right. So, but uh, it was actually pretty, pretty, like, I want to say it was a lot harder on, like, the couples because, you know, you're in for six, you're gone for six, and it's consistent. Um, We would come back, I think, sometime after, like, three months for, like, a quick stop in home port then leave again Mm. so it was kind of like we were consistent with where we got to stop and how often we stopped but I want to say it was it was pretty rough for everybody involved because you're like okay you're six months in you're doing your PRT both times um at the end and at the beginning and you know during the downtime you're just constantly working at least for the engineers um, we were constantly working, uh, so it was not like a lot of a step down. It's just that we got to go back to our barracks rooms, and that was the only difference is that we could be in town versus like when we're out to sea, obviously. So yes, because you have you have uh, different a lot of different. There's I'm not going to name the drills, obviously, because that's kind of messed up for me to do. But there's so many drills that I the that they do in in a drilling sequence. Um, no matter if you're uh, a reactor qualified individual or not, you still have to do something that's going to, especially as an MM, you're going to be doing things that directly portray to uh, the support of of people who are a reactor doing things. Were you a mm-hmm. part of all those nuclear drills? Um, yes. Mm. I mean, I, if, you're part of the, on you. if you're part of the department, there's a lot of, you know, you have to be trained. I mean, certain sides of it, I didn't have to deal with, but other sides, like, the big drills that that could affect both sides you had to understand their side affecting your side and it it kind of went hand in hand with each other so Mm. absolutely so were you where did you meet this amazing individual that has your heart um i actually met her here in virginia um obviously on a dating app (laughs) because that's what we do nowadays Mm -hmm. But um, she is actually deployed right now. Oh, my goodness. That has to be quite a bit. Oh, it's it's the beginning. So it's not as hard as, like, say, in the next three or four months is going to be. Um, but, yeah, uh, it, it's definitely an adjustment. What um, what ship is she on? Uh, the Bush. So she's on a bush. Okay, I have a, I have a couple of buddies on the bush right now, um, and they're and they're super super awesome. So hopefully they are all there together in uh and I wish them the best. Um, so you are now, are you are you currently in the military right now or not? No. Okay, so you've already finished up your your career on a believe course, and now mm-hmm. uh your your heart is out there on the open seas, and I've 
I've never experienced that. Um, my wife has been my rock at home, but I know that it weighed heavily on her. So can you, if you're comfortable with this, of course, can you explain what it's like to, to have, to be in a relationship with somebody who's deployed? So she's been gone pretty much half of our relationship because she constantly doing detachments and coming back and going and coming back and going. So, um, I kind of had a little bit of an adjustment period to being like, okay, well, she's gone, she's back, she's gone, she's back. So that, you know, now that she's gone for an undetermined technically amount of time, you know, um, it's, it's really hard because like, I understand that, you know, at a certain point we run out of things to talk about because we managed to talk quite frequently. And then I'm like, I feel bad because I'm like, I don't have anything to tell you because nothing's really going on with me and versus her doing the same thing day in and day out. So she doesn't really have anything to add to the conversation. So we're trying to have conversation, but we can't quite find that conversation to have. So it it's like a little bit difficult and it's actually prompted me to start therapy because I've realized that I have some issues with my communication skills and I'd like to catch them now as opposed to waiting till it becomes a bigger issue. So. I know that communication was definitely a difficulty for me as well. Um, especially getting out of the military, uh, trying to, you said it, you said it just right. Trying to find things to talk about. I didn't want to tell her that, uh, I had just, I, I was awake at the time for 70 hours straight and I have another eight hours to go before I can actually lay, lay down and go to sleep because of certain circumstances that showed up and I, and I couldn't sleep when I finally got to go lay down and then I had to get back up because somebody wanted to commit suicide and jump in the water and, and, uh, you know, man overboard issues. I, I was, we're responding to that and this and that, and I didn't want to say, Oh, you know, it's, this sucks. I didn't, I didn't want to, to be that guy to say that. And, um, or just even basic communication, like you said, it definitely does dwindle. And, uh, has, has therapy been helpful for you? Um, I just started. Um, so I've been given like, kind of like homework things mm -hmm. to do, um, and been told, you know, I need to get out of my house more than I've been doing. Cause I've mm -hmm. kind of just gotten really stagnant, which has just caused my depression to kick up. Okay. And, I see. So that's been really tough in these last couple months. So I'll, I'm definitely going to try and make some changes. Um, I think I should finally start going to the gym. Yeah. That would be a good idea. <laughs> Rock on. The gym is great. It's, it's done a lot for so many people that I know. The gym yeah. is, uh, or even, be... even if not, if it's not the gym, just any form of fitness, like walking 20 minutes a day will change your life. Absolutely. Right. And because like I've got bad knees from the Navy, mm -hmm. um, I'm always really hesitant. But I know that when I was working out, it did a lot more for my knees than it, than not working out because that, that I'm stretching them, I'm using them more, um, that kind of thing. And I just I got really, like I said, stagnant. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to like find my way out of that so I don't become too complacent and mm -hmm. things like that. So. Well, I, I definitely wish you the best with that. Um, if you if you ever need any, um, I, I'm I'm linked into a lot of, of great fitness experts. And if you ever have any question, you can always just reach out. They if I don't have the answer, they'll have the answer. And we're we're a really tight network, and we're and they're so supportive. Um, they're so kind. Uh, military oriented people who really care about other people. Um, another thing that I started doing recently when I was realizing that I was having some communication issues with my wife, with my with my family, with uh, the children that I, that I really care about in my family, especially, I try to invest a lot of time with the kids. I was unable to communicate in a positive way, um, basic shit. And it was really sad for a while. I joined a veteran group where I'm able to talk to people. Um, and it's not, you know, the sit down, hi, my name's Fred. I am depressed or I am sad, or it's, it's just normal people. And you don't have to share. It's just people coming together. And, um, I can, I can definitely recommend some resources to, if you'd want, uh, if, if not, you know, it's great. But if you did want to, I could try to, uh, reach out to some of my friends and find some resources in your area. And 
wow, it has it made a big difference. I've I've gone to two things and I've ended up uh, crying afterwards, not during, not during, I kept it together. But afterwards I went home and I, uh, I shed tears because I was so overwhelmed with a feeling that I felt like I was missing for me to be able to communicate properly at all about my military experience in a positive way that didn't have to do with me. I don't know. This is weird. This is a weird feeling when you're done, when you take off the uniform, there's this weird thing that goes with it and it gets put away. And we don't, we don't really talk about that very much. Oh yeah. I transitioning for me was super, super hard. Um, And it actually was like the final straw with my family was that whole, I was by myself. I was, you know, 25 years old. I had, you know, I was trying to go to school and work at the same time. And then the family drama added to it. And I finally was just like, you know what? I need to strike out on my own. And I, you know, all my friends were still in. So my support system was on the other side of the world. And, you know, but I still speak to them all every day or not every day, but very often to, um, you know, keep that communication open with them. And they're, they've always been very supportive of me and everything that I do. So. It's good. It's good that you have a support system. I, I recently got, uh, I got, I got a random message and uh, thank God I, I picked it up. Um, a good friend from in who's in Spain right now. I'm not going to name him obviously for uh, his, his privacy. He's probably gonna listen to this. So if you're listening, buddy, much love, keep your head up, man. Um, but he reached out to me from Spain and he said that he was going through a tough time. Um, they weren't getting his meds right. There were some things going on. He was going through a tough time and uh, he, he, he took the steps to reach out and I thought it was super awesome. And sometimes you just need to be to, 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 to navigate what you're going through. Sometimes all you need is be reminded that you have a support system. Um, do you have a support system at home at all? I mean, I have a few close friends here, but for the most part, not really. Um, like, I'm not saying like they're bad friends. It's just, I don't get to see them very often. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard to get to talk to them, which is, you know, part of life. But, um, you know, uh, that's why we're going to move after she's out of the military to be closer to more of my support network. But kind of at the same time, we're leaving a bit of her support network. So it's kind of a, you know, a compromise we had to make. And it took a lot of talking before we made the decision that that's what we would do. Mm-hmm. So. Well, I love that. I love that. Uh, it's super, it's super important to have a, um, a support system, no matter what, what you're doing. And I've always had a difficult time being able to vocalize that, that I don't have one at the time or that I needed one. I didn't know the, the right words to say. So I was super, super excited when I was able to, to reach out my feelers through fitness, through shooting, through self, def- my self-defense journey, through working with domestic violence su- survivors, through, uh, just doing this, um, being able to to converse with other people and just share our experiences has been such a, a huge blessing. Um, I wouldn't trade this opportunity for the world to be able to listen to other people's experience, their stories, the things that make them tick, the things that have destroyed them as a child and how they looked at that destruction and said, you know what, I'm going to build my own version of me. Forget who I was told to be in my life. I'm going to, you know, that's, that's not who I am. I'm going to be me no matter what. And that's always inspired me so much. Yeah, that, and that's a big thing is trying to, you know, create your own image of who you want to be versus what others have told you you should be. Because I know that parts of me sometimes still struggle with that. So that's another reason I went to therapy was to try and kind of like break my mind out of that mold that it was in. Because I basically have like hit a dead zone in my life at this where it comes to like goals or like you know aspirations or things like that so Mm. i can definitely resonate with that are you thinking about making a podcast spotify has a platform that lets you make one and if i can figure it out you definitely can too you can create your own content all in one place for free with zero hang-ups and even earn money as soon as you get started 
Spotify lets you record and edit episodes from your phone or computer so you can go mobile just like I enjoy to do. My favorite thing about it is that you can create video episodes if you wish and upload them to wherever podcasts are heard. You can even set up subscriptions or if you're like me, listen to support options for listeners to help you grow. I 10 out of 10 recommend the Spotify for Podcasters app. Or, you know, why don't you just step over to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started on your own podcast. All right. So I am super, um, super excited that you have um, made the decision to, to keep moving forward towards having a support group um, that works for both you and, and seeing your relationship in a compromise that is going to benefit your other partner is super um I think I think it's great. I don't I don't think I'm I compromise enough for my relationship. So I'm gonna try to emulate that in in my actions as well. Why don't you tell me a little bit about um, growing up in the United States of America for you personally? Do you think that I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go a little bit off the deep end right now? I know that's the name of my podcast, but it's but uh regardless. I go online, I'll see people make pathetic comments that are derogatory towards people who have a different lifestyle than them, a different religion than them, a different uh, skin color than them. And I think it's it's a complete atrocity. As human beings, we should be at a better place. I mean, it's 2022. We're not, we're not writing on walls in caves. Uh, there's no reason why anyone can't love who they love. Um, I, I hate, the comments I hate the most are, um, about people who love someone of the same sex as them or that who looks the same, uh, looks like they might have the same body parts as somebody else. I can't stand that personally because I've served with so many great people and it didn't matter if they were black, white, green, purple, lesbian, straight, gay. None of that shit mattered. We're all human beings serving this country. And every single person who signed up didn't sign up to be treated differently and they didn't sign up to get people at for for people at home in our country to be treated differently. Did have you ever experienced some adversity or some backlash for being who you are? Uh, yes, I have. And um, when I first, I didn't realize that I liked women until I was in, I was literally twenty years old because. I was going through so much stuff in my teen years that it just never occurred to me. Um, my family kind of figured it out. Uh, and, you know, they had their inklings about the whole thing. But uh, personally, I just had never thought about it. Um, when I first started dating my first girlfriend, um, the family I was living with, I got mixed responses from, but overall they were very supportive and I was very grateful for that. Um, it wasn't until I was in the military that I really started to see the divide when it comes to like how people um, treated me, um, men and women. Um, so one even led to a sexual assault issue that happened to me um and it there's a certain phrase that i hear that literally is the worst thing that i can hear and i've heard it so much in my life and that specific phrase is how do you know if you haven't tried it yeah that that phrase in itself has always that is the quickest thing to get me angry mm -hmm. um i i generally will have a response for it um but it's my least favorite phrase to hear because it's very short-sighted and i generally just ask them the same question in return which usually gets them on the defensive very quickly um so it's absolutely hilarious to see them start flailing them um, to try and find a correct answer for that question. But um, yeah, especially when I started working in the shipyard after I moved to Virginia, um, I noticed that a lot of my coworkers um, had comments and things to say about me 
and who I was dating consistently, um, including people who I thought were my friends, occasionally would have comments that would make me question whether I wanted to continue that friendship. Because, you know, it's very short-sighted of people to be like, well, you know, it's, you know, you you can't know unless you've tried something. And I was like, that's not how this works. It's not true at all. Yeah, it's not how this works. And, you know, I could tell you stories upon stories of things that have happened to me, um, both by men and women. Um, so, I mean, I've definitely had my um, times and moments where I'm just kind of like, uh, I didn't really know how to handle the situation at the beginning. And then I've come to understand that there's only so much that you can put up with before you're like, you have to say something because it's just so offensive. Mm. Um, so. Absolutely. But, um, that is a, that's one, one that's really, that's really, it really sucks to hear that, that you went through that. So I'm sorry that, uh, piece, there's pieces of shit human beings in the world that would say something like that. I've never said something like that. How do you not know if you hadn't tried it? That's not that's not for me to to you know to sit there and and try to push somebody else's sexual views on another human being is something I don't really necessarily agree with. Um, I'm I'm really big on communication and respecting others and stuff like that. So that doesn't sit right with me. And and knowing that you went through that really sucks. I'm really sorry that you went through that. Um, especially when it comes to sexual assault, that's something I. And, and very uh, violently against. I've, I've gotten in quite a bit of trouble in San Diego for um, causes some serious waves in my in my military command uh, be, and and having to open reports and stuff like that because uh, ladies in my uh, at the time ladies in my um, in my division in second of it on the TR uh, after we did the crew swap with the people who were from Yuka- Yakuska, there was a lot of issues with sailors coming back and uh, preying on the, the young ladies. And I, I had a big issue with that. One, because I don't care what your rank is. You're not going to harass my dead girls. And two, um, no whip, no woman or no guy uh, deserves to be pressed upon 24-7. If, they, if they're openly saying they're uncomfortable, they don't want to deal with this shit, uh, stop sexually harassing them. So I think that's important as well. Um, it's, not, it's not hard to be a good person. It's really simple. You just kind of listen to what other people say and you – you try to make them happy and quit harassing them. It's not that difficult, but there are still uh, low lives that think that that type of stuff is acceptable. So I'm sorry you went through that. Um, no one should ever tell you, how do you not know if you haven't tried? That's, that, you know, uh, that's, that's the type of stuff that pedophiles say to kids. And it's, and there's no difference between that and, and what happened to you uh, being preyed upon is never a positive thing. So I'm sorry you went through that. Thank you. It's, um, it's definitely been a struggle um, because, you know, you get to certain points where you're just like, you know, why do I still have to keep putting up with this? Why is it still the same? Why is it from people that I've known for a while? You know, it's like, how do you not understand that it's, that you're living in a condensed view of the world and just because something is outside of your your view doesn't make it wrong. Mm-hmm. It's just different. Yeah. And you can either try to learn from it or you can sit in your box and then never grow as a person. A hundred percent. And you and we all we all can do with a bit of a bit of personal growth. We we all can. I, I try to grow every day. I try to learn new things every day. And and that's just my my personal journey to be to self betterment. It doesn't it doesn't co-align with uh being said in my ways the the most uh similar thing and the most common thing that i come across when people have an di- issue with uh previous generations uh the older people they call them the boomers or whatever right um is because they're set in their ways and they don't want it they don't do well with change and, the, and if it doesn't go their way it's the highway they deal in absolution why should we continue the same toxic habits as you know as as millennials as with Jen, whatever the hell, I don't know. I don't know the, uh, the different generational breakdowns, but as past that, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be on the same wavelength. We should not. It's good that we don't always see eye to eye with our parents and we don't see eye to eye with other people around us at different ages because we're supposed to be continuously improving. And part of that is 
uh, learning more and and not being a, a, I don't know a clo- a closed minded fuck you know there's that right mm-hmm. so yeah I well, mean it's it's definitely been an experience and surprisingly enough I've been uh, discriminated against because I have a lot of tattoos okay. which was probably one of the weirder experiences that I ever had um, Navy happened to me twice you're in the you were in the Navy and you have tattoos hmm. It was actually, mm. it was happened to me in Washington when I was out processing. What? Yeah. Yeah. And then it happened to me in Texas. Okay. So it was, it was such a weird experience because I, I'd never seen people like actively be like, oh, she's got tattoos. She's not a good person before. Like I've heard stories, <laughs> but I never had it happen. And I was just like, okay. <laughs> mm. So I just kind of took that one in stride. Yeah, that that's kind of wild. Um, yeah, that, that is. I I'll never understand that. I've uh, I've walked I've walked a, a lot of different paths in my life, and every single one of them, I don't try to judge people by what they look like or or what they put on their body. Um, mm-hmm. Artistic expression comes in many forms. One of which is tattoos. Um, some are healthy reminders that keep people sober. Um, I have a friend who has a a, a broken chain on his wrist, um, and it's and it's one of the coolest thing. I have another person who. Uh, wanted to commit suicide and he has a semicolon on his other wrist um, and it's it's overwhelming to me to see the the meanings behind people's tattoos for someone else to say oh you got a tattoo guess you can't hang out with the cool kids i have i have don't tread on me tattooed on my left arm i got hold fast cross my biceps i got matching tattoos with my wife on my back i i hope i hope i can still get a job in the future right but i don't i don't know um d- discriminating against somebody because of anything that's on their skin or what their skin looks like is a joke to me. It's, it's ridiculous. There's so much more important things than what somebody has tattooed on their body to worry about. Right. Mm-hmm. And like, don't get me wrong. Like I like to go into job interviews with long sleeve shirts because my yeah. arms are covered Yeah. Uh, with tattoos, just because I, I like to, whenever I get hired and show up in a short sleeve shirt, they get, they don't really know what to do. And they're like, Oh, you've got a lot of tattoos, but I mean, in my job fields that I've been in, they don't really care because I've been a mechanic, a welder, um, a outside machinist, and now I work at a vape store. So it's like all those jobs, you know, didn't really have any issues with tattoos, but it's still always fun to mess with people. Yeah. So you should go work as an electrician or on elevators. Uh, they 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 don't give a shit. They love people with tattoos. Uh, my, I got hired by the elevator union back when I came back for the military. My wife turned me on to it. She uh, sent me an email saying I need to call home. And I'm like, oh, what do I need to call home about? Oh, damn, another person died. Because I I've, I've, I lost quite a few people when I was deployed. So uh, she has, ran and ends up telling me, hey, honey, I got this crazy job for you. I said, I got a job right now. I'm in charge of 120 people. Like, what What? What more job are you want me to do? I, I haven't, what, what more job? I mean, I love my job. Um, she said, you're gonna make fifty dollars an hour. I said, okay. What job am I doing? <laughs> and and that was it. Um, blue collar blue collar jobs are great for people who are in the military. There's so many different programs. Helmets to hard hats. Um, just any any veteran organization out there. The VA doesn't doesn't do the best job of that because they're a government organization. But there's a bunch of non government organizations, NGOs for those who uh, who understand that. Um, that do that do deal with people who are vets who want to travel on to the next thing. So I definitely recommend if you like if you're if you, if you have the level of, level of intelligence that I'm receiving from you, uh, electrician, elevator person, or you know there's there's so many different blue collar trades out there that will pay you through the nose just for having the ability to show up and try. Ironically, yeah. I went through electrical technician school when I got out of the military and I found it exceptionally boring mm-hmm. <laughs> for my personality, okay. but my dad's a master electrician. Okay. So he owns his own company. So, um, he told me to get back into it if I felt the need because the money is really good and to do commercial work as opposed to residential, yeah. which was a lot better for you. And I was like, I'll think about it, but you know, with the, plans for my future for the next four to five years I'm gonna pretty much be out of the job fields for a while because we're gonna um, try having a kid so oh, how exciting is that that oh, is my exciting goodness. bringing life into this world that is yeah. um life's best blessing 
Yeah, it really is. we're excited. So um, I'm going to be a stay at home mom for a while. And whenever I decide to go back to the workforce, I want to go back to welding. So definitely come work on elevators. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you just sit there. Oh, well, here. Well, there. Well, there. Uh, 50 to 60. It'd probably be around $60 an hour at the time that with the way inflation is working and the new our, con our new contracts and stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, but it's a nationwide thing. The uh, elevator union is huge. So uh, yeah. and it's not just elevators, it's escalators, it's moving walks in Vegas. It's um, there's a, airports, uh, every single thing that has more than a building usually, and it's ADA approved, uh, has a, an elevator. And it's great because uh, I love I love what I do. It's so great. Um, returning back to work after my injury I just got done with. I was accepted right back into the, to, with open, open arms. They're super supportive, um, doing different hydraulic work. Um, you're doing escalator stuff. You're doing um, stuff that has to do with carpentry, um, electrician work. There's, it's, it never stops. There's a multi, it's like a multifacet skill set that you need to be able to have and maintain. So it's, it's um, super exciting. So I would definitely look into it. But if not that, then uh, find something that works for you because ultimately, um, you, you're the only one that can determine your, uh, your level of success that you want to achieve in life anyways. Yeah. So you have spent how many years now out of the military? Uh, it should be... Oh, that's, I have to do math. I got out in 2015. Okay. <laughs> so you've been out for, I would say, almost seven years. Yeah, about seven years now. Okay, solid. Yeah, me too. I got out right after right uh, after you. I got out in September of 2016. So what are some takeaways that you would say from leaving the military? Um, let's see. Definitely plan before you get out. Plan as much as possible and make sure you have the support system needed for when you get out because I didn't have a plan when I got out. I didn't have a support system when I got out. So it was, it made the transition that much harder. And like you said, there are outside resources other than the VA that you can, you know, look for that will help you with your transition. Um, if you don't have a support group, um, definitely find one or attempt to like reach out for one because even though my support system was on the other side of the world, I still was able to reach out to them when I needed to. And that made the world a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 it's definitely helped me too. Uh, there's, there's not a, there's not a, um, a kind word that I can't say about my support group. Uh, my support group is every single human being that's ever talked to me. You're a part of my support group. I have thousands of people that are part of my support group and my support group isn't just people who I've known for a long time. Like, obviously we haven't had much experience together at all, but um, we're able to have a conversation and, and find common ground. And that sometimes it might be more than, more than you could bargain for more than you could ask for even. Mm -hmm. I joined a group on Facebook that's getting much bigger. It's uh, mm -hmm. women veterans. Oh, well, let me write that down uh, for my friends. Not for me. Obviously. Um, yeah. <laughs> They do all kinds of, they're really supportive. Um, I'm not very active in the group, but I have like seen how very, you know, the more active you are, the easier it is. But it's a large community. I think they're like up to like something like almost 5,000 members, if not okay. more, of Sweet. like female veterans. Um, it's a great, it's a great place for any female veterans, as you might know. Um, they do gift exchanges, things like that. So it's it's really neat. I'll definitely direct, uh, send as many people like as I can to that. I uh, just recently joined this group called um, MVP. So it's merging veterans and players. So it's where um, it's where we find even more common ground. Um, and this and this might sound kind of off to some people who are really set in the in the military ways, but I'm going to say it anyways. Uh, so it's, there's this thing that happens to us when we take off our uniform. I talked about that earlier. Um, you pull off this uniform and at first you're like, fuck this uniform. I'm glad it's gone. And then you get this weird thing of you just lost part of your identity 
and you become you get you get separation anxiety. You're leaving your friends. You're leaving people who know you better than most people because they've seen you crack under pressure. They see you rise to the occasion. Instead of fall to your level of training, you 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 just went balls to the wall and and did your best and you succeeded or you failed. Um, and these people were there for all your strengths and weaknesses, and they're gone now. You're completely isolated. All you are, you're just a normal person. You're a fucking a fucking civilian, is what they usually say. And they're and they're, it sounds uh. It, it's really downtrodden. It's a, it's a sad thing that people say like that. So MVP is merging veterans and players. It takes people who had that same issue taken off the, mil- the military uniform with people that took off their athlete uniform. And it takes those two groups of people and merges us together so that we can kind of conform to society's uh, new way of life. Say, hey, you know, I had an issue taking off my uniform. Oh, you had an issue taking off your, your athlete uniform, you know? Hey, I'm an athlete. Do you want to come to an NFL game? Because I'm an NFL player, or I was not anymore, right? Yeah, come to come to the NFL game. They bring you out to football games. They bring you out to um to to watch movies with the team. They bring you out to sports events. With, bring your family. Bring the kids. Kind of thing like that. And it really integrates, helps integrate vets who have a difficult time integrating with society again. Um, it it definitely helps. Uh, what help one of my buddies deal with big crowds again? Uh, big crowds was a big thing for me. I don't like I don't like big crowds. I don't like uh, there's a lot of things I don't like. I don't like checkpoints. I don't like big crowds, and I don't like uh, people with their hands in their pockets. Uh, but that's all stuff that we we all we all face as veterans, right? Um, everybody has their own struggles. I think uh, it, you reminded me of this um, article I read one day that I don't remember where I read it from. It was probably Facebook uh, in one of the groups that I'm a part of, and it talked about. Um, the differences between female vets getting out and transitioning to civilian life and the different obstacles that we face as opposed to our male counterparts, Mm -hmm. especially because we're in a very male dominated, um, you know, area, you know, the military is very male dominated, obviously, and how we eventually learn to conform to that same standard and that same way of thinking so when we get out we find it very hard to connect with other females especially civilian females because our mindsets are so different because of you know that conforming to the male's point of view inside the military and then coming out and you're having to adjust to how women think as civilians and you find that there's a lot of miscommunication and a lot of things that you don't quite click with and I learned that I had the hardest time with connecting with other females when I first got out because of that same issue Um, and I would only connect with other veterans or you know especially the male veterans or just males in general because that's just how I, you know, had spent the last four years was around men consistently. And so you, you conform to that. And it's a very hard thing to find that common ground with other females who haven't experienced that and to find a way to um, have lasting friendships that way. So I think, I think, uh, and I, I totally agree with you. Um, that's something that a lot of my female friends from the military have struggled with. Something that often gets brought up. Um, they had this crazy analogy, and I never thought about it. Um, some people, some ladies are focused up with keeping up with the Kardashians. Others are form- are focused on keeping up with being comfortable around men ever again. And that hit yeah. that and that hit really differently for me. Uh, sitting sitting, uh, I was I was on a. I was watching a, a, a zoom call, um, in my free time. Cause I, I have really bad insomnia. I stay up all night. Uh, sometimes I, so I try to dedicate that to self betterment, self growth. So I, I came across a, a zoom meeting with vets and, um, it said, it said for women. And then I was like, you know what? Time for some perspective building up on this bitch. So I decided to click in and, uh, holy shit. Um, it might've said for women for real, for a reason, because I was, so cut off guard thinking like if if i have a daughter i never want her to feel these feelings 
and it uh it it broke my heart to to watch honestly um other other women a couple a couple only a couple shared at the time but it was just a, a support group for women and um I ended up unfollowing them and and blocking it out and never wanted to to go into that fire again because it was so difficult for me to sit through and listen to these ladies talk about the treatment they got in the military um where which is a very egotistical dominated uh community it really is there's a lot of people who've been in the military who didn't grow up since they were a child they left for at 18 and now they're in charge of 200 something people and they are the same kid they were mentally in a leadership position which can be extremely extremely not just pathetic but difficult um, because I wouldn't want my sister to go through something like that. And that, and that's why I can say that I know some, some of my got some of my buddy friends are going to hit me up after this and be like, dude, why do you, why do you keep saying stuff like that? Because if it was, if it was your sister or your daughter, you'd be crushed to know how ladies get treated. I've, I've had a couple of issues I've, I've rolled up on. I've walked up on the dude choking out the, the girl in, in the reactor room on the Theodore Roosevelt. And he was, and she was, she almost died, uh, choking her out. And then I, this, and then the guy tried to take the security guard's gun and shoot her like because he he just snapped because she wouldn't cough up cough it up that like we i've seen i've seen what happens when women don't submit to men in a military environment where they get so cra- caught up in their I, I call it cabin fever sometimes you just go crazy on underway you can people just snap you're good one minute you hear some bad news back home next thing you know you're literally insane so you're doing horrible things and uh it's, it's wild. I would never want my kid to feel what it's like to be a woman. You can't tell, tell somebody that you were, you were raped because you don't want to lose your advancement. That is that what, is that what type of pressure is on? It's, it's on our daughters in this country. It, it breaks, it broke my heart. And, uh, thankfully I deleted that because I couldn't, I couldn't want, I couldn't sit through another episode. I was not ready. Uh, I was not emotionally prepared or anything like that. It's, it's a, it's a lot. Um, you know, most of my close female friends have all experienced the same type of thing I have when it comes to like sexual assault, and, um, being harassed by men. And, you know, you a lot of us don't say anything because nine times out of 10, you're going to be the one that's in trouble versus the person who actually did it. I had a friend of mine who was attacked and injured. She identified the person and he still walked away. And it was like, I know that the Navy a few years back got rid of their good boy defense. Um, That was a big step forward. Um, when it comes to like charging them with the crimes that they're committing, but it's still like he said, she said kind of situations. And, you know, it's, it's terrible. Um, It really is. And it really does need to change. But like, like you said earlier, um, and a friend of mine said the same thing when I was in, she, she said, You know, these boys come in at 18 and they stay boys Mm -hmm. because it's a floating high school. That's what I always consider the carrier as. It's just a floating high school because they're coming in as children and they're staying as children because they're not exposed to, you know, growing up in, you know, the rest of the world and having to, you know, you're in this bubble and if you're being trained by people who are in the same bubble as you, you're not going to progress. You're just going to realize that, oh, I can get away with this because this guy's getting away with this. If I do everything the way he's doing it, I can get away with it and still advance. And that's a that's what people don't talk enough about is how little is actually done. Yeah, I definitely... um. I definitely can resonate with that. Uh, I got in a lot of hot water towards the end of my naval career, and it uh, it just solidified me getting out of the military, dealing with the Equal Opportunity Advisors, and not just. And I'm not saying this because like all men are bad or anything like that. I'm saying this because there's some there's some real sick individuals in positional power or who have positional authority, and they exercise it to get away with shit. 
and it's a it's a big problem. Theater on the on the theater it happened on the Theater Roosevelt. We had a lieutenant, a douchebag, Lieutenant Junior Grade Ojo, and he would harass harass our debt girls, ask them if their if their panties match their bra because they have uh mismatched uh fingernail paint and shit like that. Like this is the these are the type of douchebags we had. And and they were married or whatever kids like it's not my it's not my job to to be the marriage police but I'll tell you what it is uh, if you sexually harass you know the people that work for me instead of and you're in a leadership position you got you got shit fucked up because you got to take that shit somewhere else and I had a big issue with it they didn't like it so you know what I said fuck you uh, I said we can either fight about it either way I don't care I'm taking it to the um, equal opportunity advisor and I, I I filed an open complaint I walked in the office kicked basically kicked the door down. I didn't have the code, so I just banged on the door until someone answered, and I filed an open open complaint against my entire chain of command. And they tried to they tried to harass me, try to mess up with my time and stuff like that. But I would I have no problem going to Captain's Mass just to tell them that uh, the officers that are supposed to be my leaders are uh, are douchebags, and it's and it's okay, mm-hmm. it's okay, it's important that we have people that are will put their hand in the fire and and get burned, and then try to burn the same people that their hands there for. I'm, I was fine with it, but um. You're, that that really what you should share with me really resonates with me because um there's this lady i had on she's super awesome her name's carrie miss carrie sloan and uh she's on instagram at we the female and she's a firearm instructor she was a domestic violence survivor um and her message is is very plain that um, we need to stop having our uh women be treated like second second class human beings um, their their rights do matter, um, especially get, when it comes to gun rights. So firearm, she's also a, a certified firearm instructor um, with one of the best companies out there in, in the world that really focuses on helping people, not just veterans, but everybody uh, get comfortable with their own self-protection. And I think she's doing a lot of great work out there. So um, any anyone who's listening, who's having a difficult time with their story and, and feeling like they're the only one in a situation when you're on the, on the losing end, you're not the only one and there is a better, better future. There is a bright side of this and it, and you can claim back your life. If you have been, been preyed upon, you can uh, take your life back. And it's, it's women like Miss Carrie and uh, who really make a big, not just a big eye opening experience for me, but it really, uh, I don't know, kind of cleanses the soul to know that there's people out there who are really taking the, taking the fight to not just, the people who are doing these heinous things in the military, but also uh, the politicians who uh, keep turning a blind eye to certain things. So I, I really like what she does and I really recommend you check her out. She's super awesome. Um, but wow, it, it, it never gets easier to hear when another person, especially uh, someone who's in, in the military has gone through experiences like this. So I'm sorry you went through that. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, anyways, so what is the future looking like for you? Um, obviously your, your lover is currently deployed and I hope she returns safely and I hope she returns all the way. Uh, a lot of us vets don't come, always come home all the way and, uh, I hope she has a safe return. So what's in the future for you? Um, right now I am currently rewriting my novel. You have a novel? Yeah. What's it called? Uh, it's actually called Band of Sisters. Band of of Sisters. I love the title. Um, when is uh, the rewrite gonna? Do you think it's gonna be published uh, in the next year? Um, I want to self publish it, but I need to go through the editing stages of it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's definitely a large project. It took me seven years to write it. Wow. And it's it's my it's basically my baby because um it's so emotional and it talks about a lot of the things that we've talked about today. Mm-hmm. Um so if you do you want to know what it's about? Yes, of course okay. I do. Okay, so it's um you have the interviewer. Um, they're basically interviewing this woman who led a group of 12 women who were all kidnapped to rescue the other women that were kidnapped. And so they're basically fighting this war in the middle of nowhere. They don't know where they're at. And they have no help. They have 
basic military training and um, they have to band together to free these women as many as they can as quickly as they can. And it's told in an interview style. So you got the interviewer and then the woman who led them uh, discussing like what, how it progressed and what happened. And uh, it talks about veteran suicide. It talks about assault. It talks about, um, you know, what it's like coming back uh, when you have nobody there, things like that. Oh my God. Yeah. I, I swear to God, I have to know when this book is released. Um, Cause I, I want to read it right now. That, that, that just sold it for me already. Wow. I haven't been excited for a book since I heard Tim Kennedy was coming out with his own book um, about his failures and, and achievements in life. So, wow. Are you going gonna... to... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I actually have a short story up on Kindle right now. It's been okay. up there for a few years now. All right. Where can I where can I find this? What's the name of it? It's the same uh, Sounds of War. Sounds of War. I'm reading it this week, and I'm going to give you a bunch of feedback about how much I love it. It's uh, under my pen name, so it's E C Sparks, and it's spelled S P A R X S. Okay. I love it. I'm gonna make sure to to get that down. Wow, how exciting is that? Um, so, are you gonna be doing going on Audible? Are you gonna be reading your own novel, or are you gonna have? Are you gonna pay somebody else to read it for you? I thought about it because I also was contemplating like trying to screenwrite it to see if I could maybe sell it as a, like a short TV series, mm -hmm. because I think it would work great as one. I think but, it um, sounds like it, yeah. Right? Uh, so, I don't know, I'm not sure how my voice sounds, because I've never heard it recorded, so. Well, you should, well, you're definitely gonna hear it after this. Um, it doesn't sound bad at all. I think you should th honestly contemplate it, because when you listen, you know, when someone else reads your book, they're not gonna hear the heart and soul that goes into this they're not going to hear the emotional ups and downs they're not going to hear um you fighting back tears or letting those tears go as you read it um and those moments can be so captivating and uh immersive as a listener to listen to that's what why scars and stripes by tim kennedy is one of my favorite books because he puts you right in it and i've i've freaking bawled my eyes out a bunch of times during that because uh you can hear this person going through a horrible time in their life where they wish they had done better or they did do better or they lost children in Afghanistan trying to rescue them uh, during the during the pullout. So I love the idea you're having that this book. I can't wait to listen to it, even if I have yeah. to listen to it in somebody else's voice. I'll I'll, I'll suffer. I'll suffer along, but I really do recommend. Uh, you don't have a bad voice at all. I think you should definitely pursue it. Well, thank you. I should. So, mental health. Um, it's a it's a very very big blanket that covers only a portion of what's really out there. Um, a lot of people don't even feel comfortable talking. You uh, have obviously been brave enough to come up here and and share your personal journey to um, how you how and then your approach to how you deal with mental health. Um, this the, one of the reasons why I've been really pushing mental health on my podcast this year is because I've lost eighteen friends this year to suicide. And there's never been a better time to remind people of the, the strength and power behind just talking through your trauma instead of passing the pain. Because that's what happens when you ultimately make that decision. The people around you are going to be sitting there uh, feeling your pain that you passed on to them. So why don't you talk about your mental health journey? So I can remember that it started when I was very young. Um, uh I definitely remember the first time I ever wrote a suicide note. I was probably in the fifth grade. I was very young. Um, I didn't understand then what it was. And as I got older, it just got worse with time. Um, when I, I would, when I get so angry, I would like literally see red. I'd get so overwhelmed with emotion that I'd like punch things or hit things because the pain would bring me essentially back because it was, I could feel it and it was like um, outs, outward 
feeling other than the internal conflict I was having. And it was reminding me that I was alive and that uh, it wasn't a very healthy way to cope. Obviously, um, I did start cutting when I was in high school to try and like ease that burden that I had. And I didn't know how to talk about it. It wasn't something that was brought up in my household. It wasn't spoken about. Nobody even noticed the cuts on my arms. Um, and that to me, like in, in school with friends or family, no one noticed. And that um, took a very large toll on me growing up. And um, I would just get into these really bad moods. I would cry. I would, like I said, you know, hurt myself in some form or fashion to try and calm down. And as I got older, um, it wasn't until I was in the military that I even realized what depression was. And um, I would actually at one point was on suicide watch while I was in the military. And I remember my, I think he was a senior chief at the time, but my master chief, he pulled me aside and he said, I need you to go on a vacation. I don't care where you go or what you do, how you do it is your, your decision. But I know that you are more than this and I need you to go get your head on right before we leave for this deployment. And he was the first person who ever just took me aside and said, I understand that you're in pain. You, you're stronger than this and you can deal with this. And so I ended up going home. At the time I had stopped eating for like three or four months. I ate like once or twice a week and I was dropping weight. I was malnourished. And my cousin was the one who was like, okay, well, you need to do this and this until your body adjusts back to having food again. And after that, I, you know, I really struggled with eating um, because of my depression. It was the only thing I could control. And so I would, when I got stressed, I would stop eating. And I, I could go days before I even realized I hadn't eaten. And that caused me to have a lot of problems. I actually get chest pains um, if I stress out too much or just randomly. I've been checked. My heart's fine. But um, I do get pains uh, because of what I had done to my body. And um, after I got out of the military, I obviously kind of spiraled. Um, I finally got checked through the VA uh, for my disability and they uh, diagnosed me with major depressive disorder. And I was sent to see a psychiatrist where they put me on antidepressants. And I actually got worse on the antidepressants. And I basically was having bipolar mood swings at that point. And it made no sense to me, what was happening, I didn't understand what was happening. I didn't consciously know that it was happening to me. And I wouldn't want to say she's a friend, but the person that was in my life at the time um, was like, you're not doing okay. You need to go talk to the doctor and get on a different kind of medication. And uh, that was about three, four years ago. And then they put me on to a bipolar medication as opposed to an antidepressant. And that was the start of me calming down. And that was when I was about 29 years old. So you can imagine from the you know, fifth grade to about 29 years old, that's a large gap of time where I spent fighting every day to um, basically survive. I didn't even think I'd get to the age of 30. So when I did get to the age of 30, I was actually very proud of myself because that was something that I never thought I was gonna do. Um, there were many, many times that I was uh, suicidal. And at the time, the only thing stopping me was knowing that if I did end my life, my best friend would have to be the one to tell the others what happened. And I could not put that on her. Um, so that's what stopped me as I got older from doing that. And once I got on the new medication, 
Um, it took a little bit of like finding the right dosage for me. I'm actually on a very low dosage and it does very well for me. Um, I haven't been suicidal in a few years now. That's good. Um, I generally handle my, my issues with a little bit more clarity than I did before. Um, I still go through depression. I still have, you know, times where my depression does act up and it does get out of hand. I basically live in a, in this little frame. I can't go too high with my emotions, good emotions, and I can't go too low with my bad emotions. I have to stay in this little middle ground because the too high or too low will tip me over and I will spiral. So I've learned that through my life is that, you know, I can't be overwhelmed with either type of emotion or otherwise I'm going to spiral. Mm. So it makes dealing with things a little bit more difficult knowing that because I can't be like excessively happy about something for too long because then I'll crash or I can't be super upset about something because then I'll crash. So I just find that middle ground and I kind of stay in there. Um, it does feel restricting at times, but it's what's kept me balanced. And it's definitely been a long journey. It's been a long struggle that isn't, isn't over even with medication. Um, again, another reason that I started therapy. There was many reasons that I started therapy, but um, I definitely feel that I wasn't dealing with the past trauma that I had and that still kind of kept me in the in a box and that I'm hoping to get out of because my mental health is really what's the most important thing and you know my wife all the time has been like you know you're my world and I'm like that's great but I can't say the same because I have to be my world I have to put myself first but I can still put you as the most important thing, but I still have to take care of me at the same time. So we have to be on a level playing field where I'm just as important as you're important in my life. Because if I'm not taking care of me, then I'm not gonna be there for you. And she, it took a little bit of convincing for her to understand where I was coming from and that I needed us both to be just as important to each other because at the end of the day, like if I'm not okay, I could react out and hurt you, or I could not be there for you if I'm not in the correct headspace. And you know, that's affected a lot of relationships that I didn't realize at the time, like where I'd always put that person first all the time was actually detrimental to me specifically. So I don't. I always hear that people say, you know, put your spouse first and things like that. And I don't know if that's just how I was raised, but um, I, I definitely learned over time that, you know, we have to both be equally as important to maintain a balance and communication and we're not overwhelming each other with, you know, too much of one thing or another. So, but um definitely was a hard road to travel and I still work very hard on traveling that road every day I'm always on top of my medication I always you know make my um you know talk to my psychiatrist do my checkups make sure I have my medications things like that because I know what I'm like not on medication and I don't like being that person so um, so there's a lot of things you just said right there. Wow. It's a lot to unpack. Um, there are so many great things that can be said about how you are very self-conscious and very, I wouldn't say self-conscious because I think that's, that's a, a poor way of saying it. So I apologize, but I would say self-aware. You're very self-aware mm -hmm. of, of these healthy boundaries that you set for yourself so that you can be the best you that you, that you appreciate when you see, you appreciate the things you say, you appreciate who you see in the mirror, looking back at you with confidence, with love for yourself and for your partner as well. I definitely do agree that you have to uh, love yourself before you can love anybody else. And Mary J. Blythe said it in one of her recent songs and I loved it, but um, you really do. 
it's not a, a cliche kind of thing. It's really, it, it's like, I would call it one of my laws in life. Now you do have to love yourself and self-love is self-discipline. That can be saying, oh, you know, I'd really love to eat this pizza, but um, you know, I, I have to run like 20 miles tomorrow because I'm doing a, a, a 20 mile run or some shit, right? Everybody has different goals or it could be as simple as saying, I don't like when I feel like this. So I'm not going to feel like this anymore. And I'm going to put in integer here, integer here, positive integer here. And this is how I'm going to make the version of me that I like. Self-love can be, and self-discipline can be as easy as saying, I'm not going to, I'm sad, I'm upset. So I'm not going to drink alcohol right now because I want to set those healthy boundaries and not drink when I'm upset. There's a bunch of healthy boundaries we can all set. And I think you do a great job of it. I, um, wow, I want to, I want to commend you on one, not, uh, inflicting self-harm to yourself anymore. It, it, I never understood it when I was young. Um, and I, I don't think I ever will. And I, I don't, but I don't need to, um, it's cause it's not, it's not my journey. Um, but, but being able to, to, to not harm yourself anymore when you're feeling at those lowest of the lows is what really, uh, is always, it's always a beautiful transformation to me. Um, so I'm super happy for you that you're able to do that. Um, mental health is not something that a lot it's, it's normal to talk about yet. It's really not. Um, it's, it's frowned upon, looked at as weak. Oh, mental health. Blah, 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 blah. Like, I don't, I don't like that shit when people talk like that. Everybody has highs and lows. We all just categorize it mentally and emotionally and physically and sometimes verbally as well, differently. Um, we all have our own journeys, whether it's self defense, fitness, um, mental health, uh, whether it's setting health, those healthy boundaries, or sometimes there's literally a journey to just telling people, no, I don't want this. I want what I want, not what you want. And to be not to be self-servant or to be self-servant instead of serving the world. And you can't serve the whole world if you're not serving yourself because you're a part of the world. Um, it's super important to put on your own mask first uh, that's the way they say it on the airplanes, right? So you put on your own mask before you help somebody else. And uh, that's how I look at self-discipline and self-love. So during my time work, working on being better about mental health, um, I noticed a lot of things about myself. I can't not do fitness. It's not a positive thing for me. I need those dorf, dorf, endorphins to, to go through my brain. I need dopamine to flow when I'm exercising. I need to commit the violence that I want to do to, to people that deserve violence in my, in my humble opinion, uh, I need to commit that into fitness and to, into, it's really easy to push weight around and exert that negativity and breathe in that positivity. So, um, mental health can be a lot of things. Um, for me, it was fitness and now it's, um, self-defense. Now it's, uh, it's also talking to other people about my problems and, and also talking to people about my solutions. So what, would you say to anybody who has had a similar journey to you listening to this, um, who doesn't know where to get started about um, walking that line of self-love again, what would you say to someone like that? I think um, really the whole, you know, you have, if you don't have a support group, it's very hard to find your way forward um, because it takes outside perspectives to kind of be like, hey, we're concerned about you. Um, is there something bothering you kind of thing? Because it took it took most of my friends prompting me to really realize what was happening to me and what had been happening to me for years um, to realize that I needed to get help and for them to tell me it's okay to get help. And we don't hear that enough. Because, you know, one of the things you'll always hear when people are like, oh, I'm depressed. They're like, oh, you're just sad. Do something else. You'll feel better. That's, that's not what it is. And it's not always what it is. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times it's, you don't feel anything. You don't feel happy. You don't feel sad. You do, you're just numb to the world. And when you get to that point, it's really hard to see a way out of it. And you have to know deep down that you want to get better. It has to be a personal choice for you. You have to want to take that step to get better, 
to, because you, you can't force someone to get better. You have to, it has to be a decision they make. And a lot of people don't know that it's, it's really simple to, to work forward from that because it seems so hard and so dark and so overwhelming when you're in it that you're like, what else is there besides this? Because it's, it's not something that you can see that you can fight. It's something that you feel and you don't understand why you feel it. And you don't understand like how to get better from it. And there's, there's a lot more resources now. And this whole, oh, I have to sit and talk about my feelings. That's, that's not what therapy is. Like, yes, you can talk about your feelings, but they're going to try and guide you to where you feel comfortable talking. At least that's what they should be doing is what you feel comfortable discussing, what you feel comfortable bringing up, where you feel that you want to start, because that is what's really important is where you want to start and where you want to move forward and what your goals are for, you know, being in therapy are, and, you know, a lot of people were like, oh, you just need to be on medication. Well, some people don't do well on medication. I Um, I definitely never, never did well with medication. They tried to drug me up when my grandpa died. It wasn't good. Yeah. And not everything requires medication. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes it does. Sometimes it does. Sometimes, like I said, I'm on a very low dosage. I don't need a high dosage because it actually makes me numb. And I learned that through trial and error. And when my friend reached out to um, to her therapist to get help, um, she was on a low dosage and then they bumped her up to a higher dosage within like a couple of weeks. And I was like, your body's not even used to the medication yet. They shouldn't have jumped you up. And then she had an adverse reaction. And so that kind of put her off, you know, kind of made her take a step back and be like, wait, like, that's not what this is supposed to do. And, you know, there, there are some times where it can go wrong, but it doesn't always go wrong. It's just, you got to be able to communicate and say, okay, this was too much. Maybe we should start back here because it is overwhelming. And you, it seems like there's no way forward, but there's always a way forward. It's just, you have to be willing to make that journey, whether it's, with people or without you have to choose that this is for you you can't be for someone else it has to be for you because if you if it's for someone else then you just feel like you're being forced into it and it's not really about you and um because I I kind of had it forced on me a couple times and that's what I gained from that and this is all just my personal experience obviously I'm not a therapist but I learned that when it comes to like helping my friends with their mental health, I I always ask them, I was like, are you ready to take this journey? Because you can't just stop halfway because then you're just going to prove to yourself that it wasn't worth it. And you're just going to fall even further than what you were before. Mm -hmm. Because once you start, you, it's, you got to follow through. And that's the hardest part is the follow through. Because you're, you'll get to a point where you're like, well, this isn't doing anything. Maybe I should stop. And then when you stop, you just drop even further. And it's like, you know, how it, I was right. It's not worth it. And you can spiral that after that. So I completely agree with you. Um, it, it is so, it's so important to, to do it for yourself. Um, not being, not being forced into it is, is definitely something that's so important. Um, I, there's been times in my life where I wasn't ready to, to seek, to seek help from, for things I was going through. I've, I've dealt with a ridiculous amount of guilt surrounding my father's situation, him dying in deployment, what, what went with it. Um, I've had a very colorful, pla- colorful past and, uh, and it, it's really frustrating and difficult to try to navigate that on your own. Um, thankfully I have a great support system. Um, and I'm, I'm still kind of working on it. I'm still kind of working on that whole open up and talk about your, your feelings thing. Sometimes I bite off more than I can chew, and that's what my support system's for. Hey, uh, I'm I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect, and and imperfection is is beautiful. Kendrick Lamar said that in one of his most recent performances, and it was it uh it almost brought me straight to tears. Uh, imperfection is beauty. We are all meant to be 
uh, human beings on our own journey. And, and there's no straight path. There's no, here, take a right in three miles. There's no, there's no Siri guiding you through your own life journey. We all have our own path. And, you know, there's, there's multiple paths to take. There's the path to the fuck up. There's the path of the, of the, I'm on a, like I'm destined for success in my life. And there's multiple different avenues in between those two things. There's no blanket, blanket pill that works for everybody for mental health. There's no blanket approach. There's no all encompassing. This is the best way to deal with what you're going through because we're all individuals and we all have our own weaknesses, strengths, uh, difficulties, trials, tribulations, triumphs. And, uh, you being here today is a testament to you committing to those, to those triumphs. So I, uh, I do, I do commend you on that. It's, it's great to hear, um, that you're still here and why you're still here because you, you stuck with your program and whatever that might entail, whether it's just therapy or it's therapy in low dose medicine, or it's therapy in a lot of different medicine. I have a friend that um, is on so much medicine. I, sometimes I get nervous for him and, and ask him like, do you, do you have control of your own emotions? He said, no. And, I, and that's for a reason. I say, okay, well, that, well, that's what works for you, brother. Um, and I, and I want to support everybody and in, in their way of getting there. Um, this, there's no, there's no easy straight line. This is not, this is not a um, game. One of the Game of Thrones. I think it was season five where Bran, uh, not Bran, but Rickon is running. He's straight away from uh, Ramsey, and and Ramsey's just launching arrows, and Rickon's running straight instead of zigzagging away from, so he doesn't get hit in the back with the arrow. He just runs straight, and then bam, gets hit with the arrow in the back. That's not the best way to approach uh, mental health. Running straight. There's, there's, we all have, we all have different bumps in the road things that are in our way obstacles flare-ups flare-ups are a big thing uh whether it's an injury that you're fl- having a flare-up with or a tough time uh i like for instance i've lost two people from this uh in my family this week i just found it yesterday and i it still it feels still feels weird to me still feels numb because um things emotionally register different with people so there's a lot that encompasses mental health and i was having a good dis- discussion with somebody on facebook today um surrounding what mental health is and uh he said that you know, not everybody should use mental health as as a as I, I think what he's trying to get across is that not everybody should clean the mental health as an excuse as something and i said i i agree i don't think it should be an excuse but uh mental health is isn't just a thing that you just apply here or there it's kind of a journey that you go on and some people have serious lows and and that's what what it is they're they're struggling with mental health some people have serious highs and uh, every day that you're here right now is what's awesome. And I, uh, I just want to say that it's really great that you found therapy to work for you. I, I definitely struggle with it personally. Um, finding a good therapist that sits right with me. I had a lot of difficulty doing it as a child and I had some difficulty doing it as a teenager. Um, but something that I said was, uh, on Facebook last year, and it, it, it'll it'll never leave my soul ever. I uh, put out a post after my friend committed suicide. I said, "Hey, I'd, I uh, I really don't want to go to anybody else's funeral. Um, please talk to me if you're if you're if you feel like you need to talk to somebody. Please please talk to me." And and somebody uh, I, I got a bunch of shares or whatever went all over the United States or whatever. Uh, you know, as social media does. And someone commented saying that uh, I'm not a, I'm not licensed or an expert in mental health and I shouldn't speak up. You don't have to be a licensed expert to give a fuck. You just don't, or just or just to be a listening ear. And so that's why I want to I want to really really highlight that because you having a support system is a bunch of people who do honestly care. And if everybody had that, the world would be so, such a better place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I definitely can agree with that because, uh, I mean, reaching out to help people is not just because you're licensed or whatever. It's because you actually care. Like, I feel like that's an unfair statement because, you know, not everybody's going to be a licensed therapist and that that's not, may not be what you need at the time anyways. Mm-hmm. So. Absolutely. Well, I know it is late over there for you on the East coast and I appreciate you, uh, traveling through time to make this possible um i know you probably had a long day after work so thank you so much for your time um miss crawford i appreciate you um i appreciate your your wife for serving this country i appreciate you for serving this country um 
people in the, in America don't understand how special it is to not have to worry about their sons and daughters being drafted. Um, and it's on, honestly because of people like you and, and your lady who sign up and give part of their life for something better than themselves. So um, thank you for your service. And I appreciate your sacrifice of, and when I say sacrifice, I'm talking about the time you spend with the person you love the most on this earth who is forward deployed right now, uh, putting her safety, uh, your relationship, your foundation of what your relationship is built on, which is, you know, being together on the line, just so I can sit here in my, uh, in my house with my family. Uh, I really do appreciate it. So thank you so much for that. Thank you for sharing your journey. Thank you for uh, being transparent and open. Um, and fuck, thanks for being here today, honestly, because uh, without, without your perspective, I wouldn't be the same person. I was uh, before we started this. So thank you so much. I'm definitely going to listen back to this. And and there's a lot of lessons I need to take away from this. And your book, I'm definitely going to be checking it out. And I can't wait for you to release uh, your seven-year project in, uh, you know, when that final product comes out, it's going to be very, I think, impactful and moving for me. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for uh, having me. I appreciate the um, time to talk and I think that was a really good you know thing for me to be able to talk about thank you will you enjoy your evening thank you so much for your time and if you like what we do here on off the deep end please do make sure to share this talk about what you like if you don't like what I say or something that I um, try to put out to the world you can always reach out to me on my Facebook page and we can have a conversation because I do not know everything um, I'm, I'm always, everything's subject to change. So I could be just an asshole on here talking with, talking with somebody special. So thank you, um, for listening as always your life matters. Please don't pass the pain. There's always another reason to stick it out another day and reach out if you're going through something tough, difficult as always to everybody deploy listening. Thank you for your service. We spent a lot of time on this podcast talking about mental health, but I want to talk about physical health for a second. There's nothing more uplifting and confidence boosting than looking in the mirror and seeing exactly what you want looking back at you. The person I trust to make sure that's happening, no matter if I'm going through an injury or not, is Brian Click. He's my friend, mentor, coach, and now one of our sponsors here at Off the Deep End. Head over to the link in the description and check out why I choose him. All over his Instagram and his website, you will be seeing the different clients who have worked with him in the past, whether it's bodybuilding or just maintaining a healthy lifestyle or working towards a certain goal in a sport and making sure you make weight. Brian is a guy I trust for every single different category and facet that fitness surrounds. There's nothing more important than liking what you see in the mirror and liking how you feel when you wake up every day. So head over to his website and get this process started.